Uh, good morning. Thank you all for coming. My name is Bob Perito. I'm the director of the Center for Security Sector Governance here at USIP. Um, this is uh, a meeting that begins with some uh, advanced nostalgia. This will be the last meeting of the SSR Working Group to be held in this building. Uh, the next time we have an event will be in our new headquarters over on 23rd and Constitution. Um, photographs of the new building are on the walls around here, so you can see that we're actually moving up in the world. Uh, so it's a very exciting time ahead of us. Um, this is the second uh, time that the um, SSR Working Group has looked at the nexus between um, the disarmament, demobilization, and rehabilitation, DDR, and SSR, security sector reform. The first time we did this was almost a year ago in uh, March. We co-sponsored a conference at the National Defense University with the Center for Complex Operations, and we looked at um, this issue from a number of perspectives. The basic uh, paper for that conference was written by Sean McFate, who some of you know, it's called The Link Between DDR and SSR in Conflict-Affected Countries. The paper is on the table outside, and I recommend that you, you take a copy with you when you leave. Um, the findings from this conference challenged what is the conventional wisdom on this topic, which is that DDR and SSR are not related, that they're done by separate folks on separate occasions, and that they're linear. You know, first you do one, you disarm, and then you do the other one, you rebuild. Uh, the findings from that conference indicated that perhaps the conventional, the conventional wisdom wasn't correct. And so we decided to do a series of follow-on studies looking at specific cases. And this is the first case that's, uh, that's been done. And uh, it will eventually, within the next 60 days or something, uh, result in a new paper. Um, the focus of this case study is on the uh, experiences in Afghanistan with DDR and SSR in the period from 2002 to 2005. The paper that will emerge from this uh, effort is being prepared by Professor Carolyn Hartzell, who is a USIP Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow this year. Um, and the meeting, this meeting, <coughs> the commentaries of the panel, the, the comments and questions from the audience will form uh, and inform her research. In Afghanistan, if you recall, back in 2002, under the, the, what was called the lead nation approach, responsibilities for DDR and SSR were divided up among a group of countries. Japan and the United Nations got DDR. Uh, the United States was tasked with rebuilding the new Afghan National Army. And Germany was tasked with building the new Afghan National Police. <clears throat> in 2005, I was in Kabul, and just by happenstance, I was in the UN headquarters when a press conference was held celebrating the successful completion of the DDR program. Uh, and uh, as I sat there, a little bit mystified as to how I got in the room at this time, uh, but they were offering free food and drinks, and so I thought this was a great opportunity. Uh, and listening to the congratulatory speeches, I thought that it seemed somewhat out of sync with what I knew was going on in the rest of the country. And a few days later, when I was down in Jalalabad, sitting in the backseat of an armored Humvee in body armor, looking up through the hole in the roof at the gunner who was manning a heavy machine gun, I thought, wait a minute, the, you know, the war didn't end. Something's out of sync here. Um, so um, perhaps in keeping with that thought that something was out of sync, uh, I encouraged Professor Hartzell to uh, titled her paper something like DDR in Afghanistan, did we disarm our friends? Uh, so anyway, we'll see. To discuss this and other related questions, we have put together an extremely distinguished group of experts this morning. And uh, perhaps it's only fitting that in this sort of final event in this building, uh, the panel has kind of a feeling of a, of a family affair. Um, our first speaker this morning will be Professor Hartzell, who's with us this year. Uh, as a Jennings Randolph Fellow and uh, taking a year off from her day job where she's a professor of political science at Gettysburg College. Uh, our second speaker, speaker will be Shamamud Mikhail, who is uh, the uh, director of the USIP office in Kabul. 
Um, he is also a former deputy minister of the interior and during this period, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005. Uh, and uh, Shamabu doesn't remember me, but I was going through my card collection the other day and I came up with his card and I was one of the thousands of foreign visitors that filed through his office during the period when he was the deputy. But it, Shamabu just got off a plane yesterday. Uh, he's actually participating in two conferences this morning. So we have him for a while, but if he gets up and leaves, it's because his schedule, which I've seen looks like a dentist's office schedule, you know, there's something going on every 15 minutes. Um, our third speaker is Tom Donnelly, who is the director of the Center of Defensive Studies, or Defense Studies, I'm sorry, at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Tom is really a neighbor. He lives across the street or works across the street. Um, He's invited me uh, across for coffee on a number of occasions, and uh, this may be the first time I've ever reciprocated and, <laughs> and invited you over. So uh, uh, I've been looking for an opportunity to do this, and it's finally come. Um, and finally, uh, Mark Sedra, a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation and a senior research scholar at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Um, I've been up to visit Mark. He's been down to visit us. He's spoken here on numerous occasions. Uh, we always use him in the same way. He's always the guy that, uh, that speaks last and, and criticizes everyone. So, uh, but it's, uh, it's a gathering of old friends up here, and uh, I want to welcome you. And when we finish with the presentations by the panel, then we'll open the floor. Uh, I want to say one more thing about Mark, and that Mark has just produced the most amazing new book, the Future of Security Sector Reform. Uh, it's available online. And so uh, tomorrow, I'll put in a plug for Mark, uh, <laughs> Mark is speaking and introducing his book at a rival think tank in town, which uh, will not be named, of course. But if you're in front of the Center for Strategic and International Studies tomorrow morning at TED, go in and, uh, and listen to a presentation on the book. Anyway, thank you very much. And we'll begin. Professor Hartzell. Thank you. You want to stand up and speak to the yeah, you have to because okay. you can't be sure. <laughs> I really do then. No, the cameras will not oh, capture okay. you if you're sitting down. <laughs> that was my strategy. Yeah. All right. um, okay. Um, thanks uh, to Bob and the working group for inviting me to participate this, in this, and um, to all of you for braving traffic and weather and whatnot to, to be here today. Um, let me just give you start by giving you a really brief outline of um, the remarks I'm going to make, just uh, by way of kind of a. a guideline here. Um, I'm going to start very, very briefly by just outlining um, the objectives of the DDR program in Afghanistan. Speak also quite briefly about the challenges inherent in carrying out DDR in this particular environment and security sector reform. Um, I'll also speak and limit my remarks again um, on, uh, about the process, how DDR played out in Afghanistan. Um, talk a bit about the outcomes and then end briefly with um, what happened. Uh, how, do, how do we account for the types of outcomes uh, we saw there? Um, so let me start first just by saying a word about the objectives of DDR in Afghanistan. All right. um, DDR, which was a core part of Afghanistan's New Beginnings program, uh, which was a United Nations development program responsible for security sector reform, had three objectives um, in terms of how what it was supposed to achieve in Afghanistan. Um, first was to break, and I quote here, the historic patriarchal chain of command, end quote, between former commanders and their troops in the country. Second, to assist former armed members of the Afghan military forces, AMF, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, um, to make the transition from military into civilian life. And um, again, here in particular, the goal was to equip them to find alternative sources of gainful employment other than at the point of a gun. Um, and three, to collect, store, and deactivate weapons in the possession of the AMF. More generally, um, achieving these three goals uh, of DDR was an integral process, um, a part of the process of enabling the Afghan government to establish a monopoly on the use of force, um, which is a critical step in terms of efforts to help protect citizens from threats and uphold the rule of law. A successful DDR program had the potential to contribute to this outcome in a variety of ways. One was obviously by breaking the linkages between commanders and militiamen. Um, this could help to weaken the power of groups competing with the government for control of the state. 
Second, it could help to limit armed challenges to the state by providing non-state armed actors with incentives to enter civilian life. And finally, DDR could contribute to the reconstitution of statutory forces responsible for providing security um, as formally trained ex-combatants sought reintegration in the new security sector. And I'll also talk briefly about that and the extent to which uh, that did and did not happen in a little bit. Um, all right, with those as the goals, and they're pretty clearly delineated goals, let me talk a little bit first about the very real challenges of carrying all of this out, trying to achieve these goals in an environment like Afghanistan. Um, and th <laughs> there are many challenges we could talk about with respect to this, so I'm going to limit my um, kind of uh, summary of these to three main points. Um, one is first that DDR is customarily undertaken in post-conflict environments. All right, so you end a civil, now more generally, you end a civil war, there's a DDR program, um, but the idea is the conflict has ended and now you carry out DDR. Um, I think we can probably all agree that the term post-conflict um, really didn't characterize Afghanistan at the time this program was undertaken. Um, you had, obviously, especially in the southern part of the country, efforts still to um, ferret out and combat the Taliban. Um, so again, I would just emphasize the difficulty of carrying out a program like this in something that is not, strictly speaking, a post-conflict environment. That would be one main point. Um, the second is just to point out, perhaps the obvious, which is that 30 years of near-continuous armed conflict with all that implies for the destruction of national institutions and increased reliance by communal groups on local authority structures for providing security and resources are also going to make this an exceedingly challenging task to carry out DDR. Um, people now had not for years looked to the state to provide security. They had looked to these armed militias, all right? Not even just security, but also related to livelihood, welfare, et cetera. Um, related to this 30 years of warfare, too, you also have issues of what is the capacity anymore to carry out a number of functions, et cetera. Um, and the third point uh, that I would emphasize is, and I should say that this is particularly kind of my end to this topic, um, has to do with the nature of the key agreement um, that initially set out the new rules of the game for post-Taliban Afghanistan. Um, usually, again, when we're talking about these kinds of um, contexts, it's a peace settlement of some sort. Right? So it's, uh, you, you bring the contending groups to the table and you iron out a peace settlement and part of that deals with DDR. Um, but interestingly enough, the key document, one, wasn't strictly speaking a peace settlement and I'm talking about the Bonn Agreement, right, because you bring selected actors to the table, Taliban are excluded, for example. Um, you bring them to the table, it's not strictly speaking a peace settlement and it didn't even mention DDR. All right, so the Bonn Agreement, which again sets out these new rules of the game for post-Taliban Afghanistan, doesn't even mention DDR. Um, this, to me, as someone who studies peace settlements, and particularly my focus is on power sharing agreements as part of peace settlements, um, is utterly astounding in the sense that with the Bonn Agreement, you did see other efforts made to balance power among groups. Um, through political power sharing in particular, and uh, accounts of Bonn talk about all the wrangling and backroom dealing on, on, you know, let's even create new ministries, for example, so that we can give some of them to some of the other groups, so that we can say we've kind of more equitably split up the number of uh, political ministries, et cetera. Um, so you see all that going on at Bonn, but you don't see the uh, issue of DDR touched at all. The Bonn Agreement seemingly willfully ignored or, um, the fact that efforts to disarm and dismantle armed groups and to reconstitute the state security forces alter the balance of power among groups in states emerging from conflict. As such, the issue of DDR should have been on the table to begin with and should have been addressed along with other measures for the sharing of power, but it was not. Um, so that's, again, some, some sense of sort of the, um, the context in the, that we, we're looking at here in terms of carrying out DDR in Afghanistan um, and the challenges that context presents. Um, a little bit then, um, oh, let me just say one other thing. So <laughs> here I've laid on all these challenges and talked about the complexity of, of carrying out DDR in this environment. Um, I do say, note at the beginning of the paper, though, that um, Despite all these many challenges, 
there was seemingly a window for opportunity for following through on the goals of DDR um, for a couple of years after the signing of the bond agreement. Okay. Among other things, during this time, the security <coughs> situation throughout much of the country was relatively calm, not totally calm. It's not, again, this post, it's pure post-conflict environment, but it's relatively calm. The population was still generally supportive of efforts to establish peace, and the politici politicization of the security sector that began to develop in the wake of the Bonn Agreement was not yet entrenched. So you did maybe have a window of opportunity of a couple of years here to actually try to follow through on the goals laid out of DDR, all right? Um, I'll talk about then what happens in a little bit. Process, um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the process here. Um, what I would note is um, that the DDR program and security sector reform process developed in a series of fits and starts over a period of more than five years, starting with the Bonn Agreement. Um, I, I'm really not going to spend too much time on this. Mark has written extensively on this. So the, the framework being, you know, from not addressing it initially uh, at Bonn, then SSR starts to get some attention at the Geneva meeting um, of the G8 security donors meeting um, in the spring of 2002. There's more attention then in December of 2002 um, at a conference of foreign ministers. Um, and there you get the Petersburg Decree, which says, okay, we're going to establish an ethnically balanced Afghan National Army, uh, and we're going to have a DDR program. Um, and then, so there's a series of steps that, that follow from there. Um, and what I know is then an agreement to establish the AMPB was signed on uh, eight, in April of 2003. Um, and essentially what I know is that it took two years to get a framework for DDR in place. Um, and so, so nearly two years after the collapse of the Taliban regime, you finally had a framework in place then for carrying out DDR, okay? Um, the DDR program in Afghanistan was voluntary in nature. It involved unilateral disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration of the professional and jihadi personnel that made up the AMF. Just a quick word on that. AMF was, for lack of a better word, the title given to the militias that had collaborated with the um, coalition forces in the fight against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. They became the formal military structure that would be subject to DDR. Um, there were many, many other armed groups that were excluded from the AMF. Um, these would later be declared illegal and later became subject to the DIAG process, the disbandment of illegal um, armed groups, which did not itself kick in until the latter half of 2005. Um, so DDR was focused just then on these <coughs> groups that were given the, the subriquet of um, the AMF. Um, it was initially established, AMPB, as a three-year program. The disarmament and demobilization process lasted from October 2003 to November 2005 when AMF forces were deemed to have been completely disbanded. Apparently this was the celebration you witnessed, or the, the, um, <coughs> the AMPB concluded the reintegration com component on July 1st, 2006, and as it was proudly proclaimed, in time and within costs. That was sort of the, the big achievement um, that was uh, signed off on with respect to that. Um, The, in the paper, I talk at some length about at, at what actually happened then with disarmament, with mo demobilization, and with reintegration. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on that. Let me just si single out a couple of um, points here. One was um, it was kind of remarkable, given the fact that one of the central objectives of DDR was to sever this historic patriarchal chain of command between commanders and their troops. Um, that no effort was made to engage commanders in the DDR process um, initially. It wasn't um, until the end of 2004 that the Senior Commander's Incentive Program was initiated. Um, the way it was initiated, the amount of resources dedicated to it, essentially the response of a lot of the senior commanders was, you know, I make more money engaging in other types of activities. It, it really wasn't that attractive of a program, and it was um, initiated quite late. Um, a couple words about military, the military reintegration aspect. Um, Afghanistan's DDR plan explicitly linked decommissioning of AMF units to the establishment of the new Afghan National Army. Um, one of the reintegration options available to former members of the AMF was to enter into the ANA. 
Um, relatively few combatants actually took advantage of that option, however. So this is one of those links you typically see between SSR and DDR, but relatively few of them took advantage of the option. One reason was um, that U.S. plans for creation of the new National Army allowed for only 10 to 20 percent of all recruits to come from the ranks of the DDR militias. Um, and this was because they didn't just want to relabel the, a, you know, relabel the AMF as the ANA. Um, there were also issues with literacy levels, skills levels, all kinds of things as well. Um, stringent age requirements, you had to be 18 to 28 for recruits, also ruled out reintegration into ANA as an option for many individuals. And finally, war weariness actually discouraged a number of former combatants from seeking employment with the ANA. A number of them simply voluntarily uh, disbanded. Um, problems surrounding military reintegration were more pronounced at the level of officers. Um, and uh, employment in the ANA was the first choice for almost all professional officers. Very few of them were able to follow up on that option, though. There were very, very few slots. Only 898 officers were reintegrated into the ANA um, out of 7,530 who sought reintegration into the ANA. Um, and there were a lot of problems here as well around what to do with these officers, the packages that were offered to them, et cetera, which I talk about in the paper. Um, let me talk a little bit now about outcomes and then end with um, a, little, um, some, a little bit of assessment here, what happened. Um, in terms of outcomes, the asking then how successful was Afghanistan's DDR program in contributing to um, reform of the country's security sector. Um, some analysts have assessed it as, you know, somewhat successful. Um, and they tend to focus on outputs then when coming to that conclusion. So they would note, for example, that the disarmament process netted 106,510 weapons, which sounds impressive, except if you know something about the number of weapons floating around in Afghanistan. Um, a number of heavy munitions, and actually there, there was, it's concluded that there was pretty good success at, at uh, getting a number of heavy munitions um, out of the hands of the militias, getting them to give them up. Um, 63,380 ex-combatants completed the disarmament process. Um, 260 AMF units were formally decommissioned. Um, so you could look at numbers like that. Um, what I argue, though, is a more meaningful way to evaluate DDR would probably be to consider the extent to which it met its three objectives. So if it had those three goals that it laid out at the, f at the beginning, how successful was it in terms of deactivating AMF weapons, assisting AMF members to make the transition into civilian life, and breaking the chain of command between militia leaders and their troops? Um, and here I argue um, the, success, the success story doesn't look quite as positive. Okay. Um, four and one half years after AMPB concluded the reintegration phase of DDR, many of the goals associated with the program have yet to be achieved, and some of the gains that were made have been undermined. Widespread rearmament has been taking place across the country. There is some evidence that faction leaders, particularly the leaders of northern minorities who fear increased Taliban influence as a result of Karzai-initiated reconcili reconciliation efforts with the Taliban, um, have been seeking to revive disbanded militias. Interviews with ex-combatants suggest that rather than contracting, many commanders' power actually expanded in the wake of DDR. Taliban insurgents have been able to regroup and in some instances have seen their numbers grow as unemployed ddr ex-combatants join their ranks. Um, so in terms of, of, of outcomes, I would emphasize those points. Um, and let me just, I think, uh, in terms of time, conclude by looking at uh, the question of what happened. How did we end up at that point um, from the, the goals of uh, the DDR program? Um, again, I would emphasize that the failure initially to engage um, with the implications DDR has on actor security and the balance of power among groups in a country where um, power literally stemmed from control over men with guns um, was a contributing factor to this. So um, not grappling with that issue at the outset um, from the Bonn Agreement, for example, um, was a contributing factor. I would argue that the international community had an opportunity to exercise some pressure at the point at, uh, in Germany. Uh, the point of negotiating the bond agreement, um, but didn't fully leverage it. 
Um, and so you saw outcomes such as um, all of the security-related ministries ended up in the hands of um, the Shirai Nazar militia leaders. Um, another point I would emphasize is that the initial decision um, by the U.S.-led coalition to operate with a light footprint led to inadequate levels of security being provided within the country. Um, and that situation was exacerbated by the fact that the main organs of the security sector, the ANA and the Afghan National Police, were being created from scratch um, almost simultaneously with DDR. So you ended up with a security vacuum, and one effect of that was to reinforce the reliance by communities on militias who had been providing for their security um, and their safety in the past. And that effectively, in some ways, you could say, re-legitimated the role of commanders who provided that public good, although they're, they're you know, it legitimated, it re-legitimated in the sense of they, were, they claimed they were providing for security. These commanders, of course, have a long history of being quite abusive of some of these communities as well. Um, I would say the leaders of the militias who sought to consolidate their power took advantage of the security void um, that was in part a product of this light footprint, and they used that to advance their own parochial interests. Um, and as you saw, positions like the Minister of Defense, Minister of Interior, and the Director of the National Directorate of Security uh, occupied by the Shuri Nazar militia members, the security sector reform process came to be looked at in with growing mistrust by many Afghans as it became increasingly politicized along communal lines. Um, okay, I'll stop there, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great introduction. And Chamabud, will you? Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, good morning, and uh, thank you, Bob, for organizing a very important topic, you know, uh, on this meeting on a very important topic, and also see our old friends Mark and also Tom, and uh, it was a very good introduction. Uh, but uh, if we just go back to the history, because we have to learn from that what we did good or bad, uh, to achieve those ob objectives or not. Uh, actually, when I just see it, uh, we had a problem in the design of this program, and also we had a problem in the implementations, and also lack of political will, because that is more important things for any program if you want to implement it. Uh, if there is no political will, we cannot achieve the objectives. And that political will was missing, is missing, and might be missing for a long time, you know? Uh, for example, if you just go to DDR, what's happened in that time, there was a millions of, I don't know, the exact numbers, one million, two million, or three million Kalashnikovs or arms in Afghanistan. What they achieved, just 60,000 or 50,000 old arms they collected, uh, and each arm they collected in that time has cost uh, about whatever, 300, 400, or 500 dollars, but you could buy the new one in the market for 150 dollars. So instead of that, we go to the program and to the process, if you're just buying, you know, these things might be more cheaper, easier, than to really go through the process. And then what has happened later on, from Central Asia, after the Soviets uh, collapse, most of those arms were coming to the northern and that were transferring to the south, to the Taliban side, mm -hmm. and from the south, drug was going on, on the same route, to the north and from the north to Central Asia and all the way to the Europe. So this become a very, you know, marriage of convenience for arm dealers and drug dealers, you know, in the same time it has happened. Uh, and so instead of that, to really strengthen this uh, disarmament, uh, demobilization, and reintegrations, instead that, like uh, Professor Harzel just mentioned, it has strengthened the power of these uh, people. But inside the system of the government also it has a problem because uh, when I say the lack of political will, those 800 people, officer, who stay in the ANA, the Afghan National Army, they in charge for senior positions. But more of the professional people who just had experience in the military, they didn't get those jobs, you know. So that people become in charge there. And the secondly, those who were not integrated there, like my former boss was saying, you know, they were just dumped on the Minister of Interior to just integrate them in the national, uh, Afghan National Police. So meaning we just brought it from there 
put them in the training course and just legitimize their powers and send them back to the same community where they came from. So this created mistrust uh, between the, uh, in the eyes of the people because uh, police has to protect the people. But unfortunately, police in Afghanistan, or because of this kind of a process of DDR, uh, even they don't protect the state, they protect their own interests. And so now, whatever national security forces we have in Afghanistan, by quantity, uh, but that quantity is not protecting the states, not protecting the people, they protect their own interests. And that is a big challenge, you know? Uh, because many times we just talk about 170,000, 132,000. Even one time in the interior ministry, we were just talking, uh, I was talking with the ministers, and he was just saying, okay, if we dismantle all police in, in the country, maybe uh, there will be no differences in the security, and people will be more, protect, more safe in the absence of these police, which cannot protect the people, you know? So that was a uh, reality on the ground there, and still we have a problem. Uh, but just go to the security sector in general. It is not question of how many people you disarmed, how many Afghan national police you built, or how many ANA you built. But the question is how you reduce the threat level. Because if the threat level is not reduced, the building of army or police is uh, not uh, that much uh, make any differences. Uh, but even uh, I might be not agree with you because uh, in terms of uh, when this DDR process was started, uh, in that time, in the first three, four years, Afghanistan was a post-conflict. Uh, it was uh, safe. You can travel any part of the country. There was no problem. Until the first emergency law in 2002, there was no single shot against the ANA and others, uh, because even the national police and others was not existing. And I was uh, conducting election for emergency law in uh, in four eastern provinces. Uh, in Nuristan and Kamdesh uh, district, which is very remote uh, there. When we enter to the village and people, uh, women from the top of the roof, they throw walnuts, you know, as gesture of goodwill, because they were that much hopeful, you know. Uh, okay, now the uh, Taliban is gone because 30 years of war and so many, uh, you know, uh, things that now people just see some hope. But unfortunately, that hope is uh, slowly because of the DDR because of the design of so many other programs, we have it in the National Army, National Police, and others. Lack of political will by, as part of the Afghan national uh, institution, national leaders there, and also political leaders. And also lack of willing by the international community also to sacrifice the rules of law for short-term stability. Uh, and this argument was going on for the last 10 years. Okay, if we just touch these things, maybe will be more instability, uh, and that way, is maybe uh, not good, you know? But in fact, uh, rules of law is a big issue. And uh, as long as if you don't focus on that, maybe we, according to the human rights people, you know, just maybe whatever crime has happened a few years back, uh, if you even forget that, if somebody commit crime today and you are soft on that, uh, you cannot bring uh, stability to a country. And the most important thing with the DDR was that it was not linked to the security governance and development uh, things uh, uh, in the country. Uh, because money was spent, and who is in charge of the DDR? For example, the second vice president, who was himself was a warlord, who was part of this militia. So he was the one who were doing the DDR. And so that was the reason you cannot bring a stability to the country, cannot implement the program in the right way. How to design it, who implement it, what is the political will, these three or maybe more important things Maybe we can discuss and answer question uh, session later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Tom? Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. Well, I know why Bob invited me in the first place. It's because uh, I'm the neocon troglodyte from down the street. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and as such, uh, you need somebody to uh, both simplify, if not oversimplify, and clarify what's obviously a complex picture. I was struck in uh, Carolyn's presentation, and I, and I recall because, like, sort of like everybody in Washington, I also uh, made the pilgrimage to Kabul in uh, 
uh, in 2005 and 2006, uh, visited the deputy minister who was the exemplar of a good guy in the Afghan government uh, at the time. But uh, Carolyn's line about uh, the DDR folks being very proud of being uh, on time and under budget uh, uh, struck a very resonant chord for me because uh, not only was it true of that program, but I would say it's true uh, even today of the entire uh, American and Western approach uh, uh, to the problems of Afghanistan are driven by the desire to do it cheaply, to do it on schedule, uh, and without very much reference to conditions on the ground. Um, analogies between Afghanistan and Vietnam are always kind of sketchy and not probably worth uh, the effort. Uh, but um, soldiers used to say that we didn't fight one war in Vietnam for 12 years, but the same one-year war 12 times over. And uh, maybe that's somewhat true about Afghanistan and about the DDR program in the larger context. And that's really what I want to begin to talk about. Uh, Carolyn also quite rightly said that the goal of the program, as the entire uh, goal of the time was, was to give the central government uh, uh, to make the central government uh, the dominant, to be able to control the means of violence. Nobody, I don't think, really expected to take every Kalashnikov away from every villager or every RPG or even every mortar. Uh, <coughs> but it was important to get the heavy weapons out of people's hands, and I want to return to that. But also, this was part of a larger process. In other words, to <coughs> weaken, if not completely eliminate, the forces that had been fighting previously, to build Afghan structures that could dominate the means of violence and begin to, to bring the rule of law throughout the country and to do it through the vehicle of a central government, and also to provide sufficient Western uh, uh, security forces in the interim to enable that process. In the forum, this is also uh, about the time that ISAF was stood up, uh, meaning that it was going to be uh, not just an American-led and dominated mission, but that uh, the, the burdens were going to be shared, particularly among NATO countries. And uh, in that context, uh, the labor was divvied up through the lead nation uh, system. In many ways, all of those elements, I mean, there's a reasonable structure, but uh, none of those uh, elements was either adequately resourced, adequately structured, or, uh, as we have seen in the interim uh, period, uh, adequately carried through on. And in there, to me, they seem like elements of a whole rather than discrete pieces. Again, if you wanted, wanted to get from where we were uh, in 2001 to where we hoped to be and where I think we still would like to be today, all of those things have to take place, not in the absolute sense uh, or in uh, – and pr this is particularly uh, true when it comes to the uh, uh, demobilization and reintegration elements of, of DDR. Those were always going to be the most difficult challenges. Uh, I hesitate to speak about the, you know, unchanging nature of uh, Afghan society, but certainly uh, where it was um, uh, by the time the, the Taliban was overthrown, uh, which was, as everybody has said, at the end of a, a long and a very uh, painful and violent uh, period of war, culminating in an even the ugliest period of all, the Civil War of the 1990s. So the, the likelihood that um, the various warring parties, factions in Afghanistan, were going to easily uh, uh, demobilize and be reintegrated into uh, a common society uh, was probably well outside the scope of this program as are in inherently, uh, I think, worthwhile, still necessary goals, but uh, something that the DDR program did not have the resources to do and needed to be encompassed. That was an important start to, to try to pick apart the former military structures that previously existed, none of which, uh, including the rump of the, the Afghan army, was an adequate basis uh, for building truly national forces. Uh, on the other hand, I do think uh, that the um, stripping away of uh, heavy weapon stocks was genuinely a success <coughs> of the DDR program and something that uh, uh, was 
critical to do. Again, one only has to look back to the nature of the conflict of the 1990s, uh, which is not, uh, you know, characterized by, uh, you know, great tank battles or anything like that, but those heavy weapons were particularly useful uh, for uh, the siege of Kabul, for example, for being parked outside the city and uh, shelling sort of indiscriminately uh, ci cities held by, and from time to time, uh, places like Kabul were shelled by multiple factions uh, simultaneously. So while, you know, Afghan warfare was not necessarily characterized by great mobility or tremendous amounts of firepower, uh, it had an incredibly grinding quality and um, the heavy weaponry was essential for that. So getting that out of the system, uh, you know, uh, is, was a very good thing to do, uh, even if at the time it was probably the case that many of the systems were uh, not in great repair or even non-functional. And that's something that will even, under the worst case scenarios, uh, be of great benefit and provide uh, a cushion even if things go very badly uh, in the future. So that is a real but unsung achievement. It was the one that was easiest to do, uh, the one that the DDR program was best structured to do, uh, but even allowing for that, I think it's something that we should be, be uh, very grateful for. <coughs> that said, um, the, uh, the original goal of all the programs, uh, and, and you know, we'll see what uh, General Petraeus and folks have to, to say when they testify before the <coughs> Congress in the coming months, uh, obviously remains very elusive. And I would say even at this point, we're sort of uh, unsure of our commitment to the centralizing uh, principle, even when it comes to uh, uh, the question of who controls the means of violence. You know, if you're, if you're looking for local solutions in the provinces and still trying to build particularly the ANA, to begin with the ANA, um, but also carry it through to other elements of the security <laughs> sector, there may be some in inherent contradictions that you will live uh, to regret. The ANA has been uh, a success story, generally speaking, but um, it also has been uh, poorly resourced. Again, we've taken an on-deadline and under-budget uh, approach to that, uh, for which the United States, I would say, bears the principal and most direct um, uh, blame and liability. The idea that uh, the ANA can only be as large and as strong uh, as Afghan government budgets will allow uh, has obviously been, a, um, again, an application of the on-deadline and under-budget uh, approach uh, that's been uh, counterproductive. Uh, I believe that we seem, or at least we appear to be on a direction to, to break out of that. Uh, but again, to, to conclude, um, this whole prospect, or whole project uh, of uh, deciding who controls the means of of violence in Afghanistan. Again, not to expect that, uh, again, every uh, uh, villager will have to give up his rifle or his RPG or, you know, draw the line where you like, uh, but that when push comes to shove that the Afghan government doesn't lose a firefight uh, is still a uh, principal um, uh, goal that we should aspire to, <coughs> and it's, it's tragic. Uh, that we haven't gotten farther in that project uh, in 10 years than we ought to have done. Uh, but by the same token, uh, I think we have an obligation uh, to uh, the Afghans uh, to uh, continue on and ensure that, uh, that we, we uh, fulfill that promise and that, and that goal, not only to carry through in the promises of DDR, <coughs> but on security sector reform and to make sure that our commitment uh, to uh, ensure conditions uh, under which that can happen, not only uh, uh, the balance of power on the battlefield, uh, but to, to push for representative political structures uh, in the Afghan government so that the central government can, in fact, uh, not only be the most powerful institution, but an equally uh, legitimate institution, in other words, powerful in the minds of the Afghan people. 
uh, who's, again, 10 years on, uh, as far as I can tell, the, the desire of most Afghans, first desire for most Afghans is still uh, to be safe and secure, to be able to rebuild their lives. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tom. And uh, very good. Mark? I told Mark that uh, it's now appropriate for him to get into his, his leftist socialist Canadian tendencies here. So. Uh, on yeah, the other well, side of the equation. It, it's a problem when you're supposed to be the contrarian speaker and you agree with a lot of what's been said. But uh, I'll, I'll see if I can add some, some nuance um, and a little bit more detail to a few of the, the very good points that have been made. Um, I think uh, um, Professor Hartzell's paper is, is very good, and, and it provides a very good overview of the immense challenges that DDR and SSR have faced in Afghanistan. And in fact, I think the limited success of both projects. I mean, it's very difficult to think of a more complex and difficult environment for these types of initiatives than Afghanistan. I think first I want to say, why, why is it that these two projects are connected? Because we often talk about the nexus between DDR and SSR. In fact, I just attended a conference called the nexus between DDR and SSR. And, and we can see DDR as creating the security space for the development of security institutions and justice institutions for that, for that matter, through the breakdown of armed groups and the removal of weapons from society. And SSR, for its part, can help give citizens and ex-combatants the confidence to relinquish their weapons and return to civilian life. Together, these processes can transition former warring factions into united security forces and effective government bodies. Unfortunately, in my view, the opportunities presented by the natural synergies between these programs was not adequately exploited <coughs> in Afghanistan. This partly reflects, as I said, the difficult environment in Afghanistan where we saw high levels of insecurity, although only um, after the first couple years of the post-conflict reconstruction process, acute political instability, and perhaps the most problematic factor, a multiplicity of different actors, foreign and local, each with their own unique agendas and interests. But it also reflects failures in policy and strategy, as well as, and I think Shah Mahmood hit the, the nail on the head, a lack of political will, a lack of political will among donors, and a lack of political will among local actors to see this, these processes through. Now, I think it has been said, and I agree with this point, that there was a window of opportunity uh, to advance DDR and SSR in the first couple years of the post-conflict of, I should say, the Bonn Agreement. After all, the security situation was relatively secure. I myself was able to travel around the country um, into areas that I wouldn't go to today. Warlords had yet to reestablish their fiefdoms and were, in fact, many of them were sitting on the fence. They were fearful of being hauled off to a tribunal or the Hague. They weren't sure what the position of the United States and the international community would be on past crimes. And the population was genuinely war weary and eager to see a transition to peaceful politics. Of course, um, polls are always problematic in a place like Afghanistan, but every poll I saw from that period showed that people wanted to see the guns being taken away. They, they wanted to see the different militia groups disarmed. So this confluence of factors created a very conducive environment for DDR and SSR, which frankly was just not grasped. So why wasn't it grasped? The big question. First of all, poor planning. Any good DDR program, pick up any publication that will tell you about DDR, they'll say it's based on a good needs assessment, good planning. This was never undertaken in Afghanistan. I often joke that the first plan for the AMBP was, was written on a cocktail napkin by a couple individuals who won't be named. But it was, there was no baseline data was collected. The, the initial strategies and approaches were built on hunches and guesswork, not, not solid um, study. This, the ad hoc nature in which the program was advanced um, was a product of this early beginning. When you read Professor Hartzell's paper, and I hope you do, the various programs and sub-programs that made up the AMBP almost seem mm. as elements of a well-constructed and deeply integrated plan. Those of us who are on the ground know it wasn't. This was, again, more of a trial and error approach 
where when they in, uh, experienced roadblocks, they had to hastily establish new initiatives, cancel old initiatives, and so on. The reality was very messy and convoluted with the program, again, largely advancing in an ad hoc fashion. I think the biggest problem, though, and I could go on for a while on this, was the lack of political will. The U.S. for uh, several years, of course, was arming subnational militias under the context of the war on terror to fight the Taliban, to root out al-Qaeda. The United States was not interested in disarmament at the time. For that matter, the Afghan government, particularly the Northern Alliance, was not interested in disarmament. Even though President Karzai delivered some beautiful speeches on the matter, this was really for donor consumption. Shah Mahmood mentioned the chairman of the Demobilization and Reintegration Commission was ranked by the Afghan New Beginnings Program as the second largest militia commander in the country who was not disarming. This was the individual who was supposed to lead the program, set the example. In fact, I saw a private document which listed the top 10 IAGs, as they were called, illegal armed groups, and about eight of them had, were, had high level positions within the government. It, how, what message does that send to the population? Was any pressure exerted on those individuals to disarm? No. So there was not the necessary political will, and different actors were not willing to invest the type of political capital into this process to make it succeed. The third reason was the failure to address mid-level commanders. The high-level commanders were already rich, they were already taking part in the political process, and the low-level soldiers could now access benefits through the Afghan New Beginnings program. But the mid-level actors <laughs> felt in the cold. The basic DDR packages were really not enough for them, but they also didn't have the status and prestige to enter the political process or to make large amounts of money in the illicit economy. So there was, it was not until a couple of years into the program that they really got serious about trying to address these commanders, but perhaps it was too little too late. They had already worked to subvert the program in many ways and have been very effectively been able to insulate their patronage-based networks. And the, one of the big problems in the police is they took those networks into the police. They're still there today. At the local level, local police are largely militia groups that have rehad it and now put on police uniforms. The fourth factor is the lack of focus on reintegration. Would you believe that there was ne never any labor market survey done to determine how to develop proper reintegration options? The reintegration process based, was based on giving ex-combatants basic skills to enter the economy. But there was very little effort made to actually find where they could actually access jobs in, those, in, the, in that economy. An economy that, of course, is still suffering and, and has about 40 to 50 percent unemployment. So there had to be more focus <coughs> on reintegration. Now, as was said, there are a number of people, and particularly those in the UN system, who will say that this was a success story. Why? Because the numbers look good. And, and so often, this is a numbers game, right? 63,000 disarmed um, and demobilized, 106,000 weapons collected, including 12,000 heavy weapons. And it's always good to take weapons out of circulation, even though it was a drop in the bucket as compared to the, the larger number of illegal weapons circulating in the country, and not to mention the fact that there's new weapons coming into the country um, every day. So even if we overlook the fact that a good portion of those submitted weapons were largely useless, as they were, and that most of the heavy weapons, although I agree it's an important step to get these out of circulation, and it's an important symbolic step, but most of them were also non-operational, the program has largely failed to achieve as Professor Hartzell said, its central goal, the breakdown of commander patronage networks. Those networks are not only still in operation today, although many are concealed within the police, but they're actually stronger. We see now that the security situation is deteriorating, that commanders are consolidating their networks. We see weapons flows across the country intensifying as well. People are seeing this current period as perhaps just an interlude between in an interlude in the Civil War. So, 
One issue that I think that has to be talked about is that issue of political will. And I'm going to quote from Professor Hartzell here, who makes the point, and I quote, politicization of the disarmament and demobilization processes clearly limited the extent to which linkages between militia commanders and their followers were broken and impeded the government's ability to establish a monopoly on the use of force. I'm not sure if you've changed that sentence because there's been a number of, uh, which I think is a, is, a good, is a good point. But I think I, what I would say is we often, and, and this is a lesson for any DDR and SSR program, we often refer to the need to depoliticize the security force. I see my friend Dean now in the back who is one of the main architects and, and worked on the DDR process in Afghanistan, so I'll tone down my criticism. <laughs> but um, we often refer to the need to depoliticize the security forces in the context of SSR. And we tend to treat DDR processes as technical exercises. And in my view, this is a mistake. These processes, regardless of their circumstances, will always be political. They, they can't be depoliticized by their very nature as they involve the rebalancing of power relationships in society. Donors must accept this and engage these processes accordingly with political tools, not just technical tools. And in my view, it was the unwillingness, and I'm happy to go into this further in the question period, was the unwillingness of states like the United States to invest political capital and take risks in this process that doomed demilitarization in Afghanistan. DDR donors must accept that from the outset of the process, these in endeavors are as much political as technical, and unless they express a willingness to invest those, that political capital, these processes are always going to fail. Regardless of how good the people you have on the ground, regardless of how good or how much resources you're going to invest in the process, better to invest that elsewhere if you aren't going to take those political risks. I would also talk, let me say a few words before I conclude about these connections, this nexus between DDR and SSR in Afghanistan. And I would say, in fact, it doesn't really exist in the Afghan context. At least it hasn't been operationalized. One of the most distinctive features of security sector programming in Afghanistan, and maybe even I would believe, I would say, the entire state building process, has been the lack of coordination among stakeholders, local and international. The lead nation approach has been mentioned and has been, a lot of ink has been spilled about that has compartment, compartmentalized SSR and actually created turf wars among donors and different stakeholders. Those natural synergies between DDR and SSR that I spoke about earlier were never adequately explored in the Afghan context, whether it is in the area of security force vetting or weapons management. They just never operationalized these areas of overlap. And in fact, when I spoke, and I often have, to stakeholders in the security sector about demilitarization and DDR, they had very little to say. They, they couldn't tell you how they were collaborating or working with these programs. And I should say that during my, uh, that one of the heads of the AMBP also had a very difficult time explaining to me how their program factored in to the future of security sector reform. So there were a lot of missed opportunities here. So what are the lessons? Well, I think Professor Hartzell's lessons from the Afghan case for other cases are sound. Integrate, you have to integrate DDR initially in the peace settlement. Well, it wasn't integrated in Bonn, and Bonn wasn't a peace settlement anyways. It was a victor's peace. Didn't have all of the actors to the conflict were at the table. The Taliban weren't there. You have to initiate it promptly was initiated fairly promptly in Afghanistan, but there were delays. You have to provide adequate resources. And you have to avoid counterproductive practices, like arming subnational militias, like giving private security companies a mandate where they hire whole militia groups to provide security. In essence, rearming the same people that you're trying to disarm with the program. Happy to talk about that as well. I'd merely add the following. It is not enough to start these processes early. They have to be done right. Because we often talk about windows of opportunity, but we go, sometimes go a little bit too far. 
If the program is poorly constructed, it doesn't matter about the timing, it's gonna fail. These programs have to be based on good assessments and baseline data. They must be rooted to a sound strategy, and most importantly, they must be built on some sort of political consensus, preferably as was stated in a peace agreement. Otherwise, as I've said, it's better not to invest in such programs at all because poorly devised or implemented DDR and SSR can do harm. We can reignite conflict cycles. And I would state that, in fact, in some areas of Afghanistan, we have done harm. I would also hasten to add, just at the end here, that what we haven't talked about was some of the successor programs to the DDR program, and I'm, I'm at time, like the DIAG program, which has been a colossal failure. And since I'm out of time, I, we can discuss that in the question period if you wish. But thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I want to thank the panel for four really excellent presentations from, from different and uh, really engaging perspectives. Um, and now I want to open the floor for questions. Um, for those of you that uh, have been here before and know the drill, we invite you to step up to the microphones on either side. Uh, that way we can capture your comments um, on, uh, uh, for the television cameras that are in the room. Um, when we get to that point, uh, I want to, uh, to ask you to identify yourself by, by name and by institution, and hopefully we'll have more questions than, than commentary. Um, but first, uh, while people are moving to the microphones, um, we are webcasting this event. Uh, we have an audience uh, out there that's larger than the room, and I want to start with a question from, from the audience uh, that's online from Jonathan, who is from the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, and is a student in Indiana University School of Law. Um, clearly, what we're talking about here has, has implications and applications in other conflicts. His question is, how do we ensure that people who go through the DDR then join the new National Army um, have things really changed so the question really has to do with, with how do we to ensure that there is a linkage between DDR and SSR, and how do we ensure that individuals involved in this process actually get to where we want them to go? Somebody want to take a shot at that? Start? Professor? I guess I would say um, there's an interesting study <coughs> by, um, by Nick Sambanis that shows that, um, in fact, <laughs> he claims that one of the the biggest impacts of DDR uh, is actually um, it's important to have the follow-on integration into the new military forces um, that one of the biggest impacts this has on, on helping to secure the peace is that it provides employment for these uh, now um, demobilized soldiers. So I guess speaking to that, um, a lot of these peace agreements that deal with um, issues of the military um, and um, D DDR and then um, integration into new military forces oftentimes purposefully inflate their militaries for a period of times afterward just as a means of providing employment for these now um, demobilized soldiers um, so that they are essentially, the hope is that by giving them this form of employment they won't prey on others in, in other fashion. So I guess I would just say that you know, there is this interesting economic argument as to the importance of integrating them. Now that doesn't, I mean I haven't even addressed um, retraining, you know, vetting for human rights abuses, all kinds of other factors one has to look at. But there is this interesting argument about the importance, in fact, um, for, the, for the stability of the peace of making sure that you do absorb large numbers of these um, once you've also addressed these other issues. Thanks very much. We'll take our first question. Hi, uh, Richard White's Hudson Institute. Um, the second speaker mentioned uh, the uh, linkages between the weapons flow into the country and the export of drugs out. Are there uh, transnational linkages uh, that we've seen between some of the groups? I mean, I know the IMU and a few other groups were based in Afghanistan before the American invasion. I wasn't sure whether those are still functional. And then it was, and then the, the second question, and these are for anybody who wants to answer, is um, the return of Russia, is that going to affect the process? Because the Russians, as we know, trained and equipped much of the current uh, factions as well as the, the military. And so if they're going to start reengaging in military training and so on, can they assist this process? Thank you. Do you want to start? It, yeah, okay. I, look, I would say there are <coughs> a couple of things. I mean, it's annoying, but I think true that the military particulars 
uh, do matter. Um, you know, controlling the international flow of small arms and uh, you know easy to transport weaponry uh, is extremely difficult to do. Certainly, some of the things that are um, you know most uh, fretful uh, in the current situation in Afghanistan, such as um, you know improvised explosive devices, are either homemade or again to the degree that they involve imported uh, know-how and technology. Again just fundamentally easily transported. Um, I don't think that anybody has seen um, a significant reintroduction of, uh, you know, heavy weaponry that's mobile and ha packs a lot of firepower. So it, it depends on the circumstances, and it depends upon, uh, uh, you know, again, the quality of the weaponry that, that you're talking about. It would be very difficult. I mean, there would be a huge signature involved with reintroducing large-scale weapons. Uh, we would have to be especially negligent, although that may not be beyond our capacity, uh, you know, to miss uh, the reintroduction of heavy weaponry to the levels and of the type uh, that were prevalent uh, in Afghanistan, um, uh, you know, in the 1990s or, or even after uh, 2002 or th 2003. Actually, just I want to, the first question about the people who DDR, you know, if DDR only is effective from my personal point of view experience, if in a country there is a group of people, they fight against the government or state, and then you just say, okay, just find somewhere for them how to reintegrate it. But in the case of Afghanistan, we were in the war for the last 32 years. So everybody is involved in the war one way or another, you know. So that was, you cannot reintegrate 30 million people in the system. You know, that is not possible. So that was the reason it has to be linked to the security sector reform, good governance and developments. It come to be a comprehensive way. Uh, we have to talk about that because if you just go back to the security yeah. sector reform, I didn't talk about too much about that. But in the one way we are trying to do DDR, then the Diag is coming. Then it's uh, coming with uh, auxiliary police. Then it's coming with... Uh, have one public protection forces, then we just come up on local uh, police forces and some others. So in one way we are trying to build an institution, another way we are trying to undermine it, you know, uh, some things. Yeah. So that was uh, really is a big dilemma in Afghanistan uh, uh, things. Uh, in terms of uh, transnational, it is transnational because the drug dealer, billions of dollars, money is, uh, drug is going on from south to the north, from Central Asia all the way to Europe is coming. These are people are involving in different ways, you know. And so it is a very big issue, become a war economy. And then there's so many other things is involving because those who are in charge, why they should bring stability? Because they will lose money, you know, they lose power and so many other things. So that is uh, things. But in terms of building military, uh, of course, you should have a, uh, what is the objective of the military to build? Uh, because what is the military, military doctrine, you know? For example, if I just ask somebody, I would like to build national police in Afghanistan is more important than to build, build the national army. Uh, because whoever is in Afghanistan, whatever regime is there, they need a good police. But the army, you have to fight against the neighbors and other threats. Uh, we cannot compete with our neighbors, you know, no matter whatever army we just built, uh, some things. And so that was the reason is that we didn't focus on the police. For example, if you just see the actual money, resources come to the police in 2006. So four years after the collapse of the Taliban. Uh, even is uh, special. Even the U.S. government was not uh, thinking that uh, building police. They were just thinking this is part of nation building. So, but they didn't see this is part of uh, war on terror. You know, because if you just talk about counterinsurgency, police is the main factor for that. So there are so many other issues. We didn't go on details on that, but. Thank you. Thank you very Can much. I add something very brief. Uh, I want to take a couple more okay. questions. Sure. 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 Russian return part. Go ahead. Just, you know, mm. the Russian, yes, they want it, but uh, Russia just uh, see what is going on in Afghanistan. They just keep themselves. Uh, if things changing, they say then we have an option, you know, we have a plan, we have others. This is all kind of uh, uh, not actively engaged in Afghanistan because the Russian only just gave a little bit money or something so armed to the ANA, 
but in fact they are not involving in the development in the last 10 years you know is not that much uh, so they just keep what will happen in Afghanistan and then have to play later on so in Karzai is also playing for the same things you know in the present uh, in the same way what will happen so they're on, on deck, but not in the game, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I think that's it. I want to take two questions now. I'll take one question from this side, one question from that side, then we'll stop and we'll ask the panel to respond. Please go ahead. Uh, Stanley Cover with the Cato Institute. I always like to evaluate current events through the prism of history. So that's my question to you. Could you fill in the blanks in the following sentence? What we are trying to do in Afghanistan with DDR and SSR is what X successfully did in Y back in Z. Please, let's have the second question. We'll start with you. Oh, great. Uh, hello, my name is Dipali Mukhopadhyay. I'm at, the, at Princeton University. Um, my question is, if, is maybe not so different in that I'm wondering if one possible lesson of the DDR experience in Afghanistan is that the international community and the certain elements in the Afghan government were actually trying to fast forward a process that in other states, when you look back historically, took hundreds of years to establish a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. And that in fact, in the Afghan case, there are many examples of negotiations and bargaining that has gone on over the last 10 years that show something not like the DDR goals that were set forth, but the integration of commanders, subcommanders, and fighters into the political system in a way that has reduced violence and <coughs> begun a process of political transformation in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Mark. Um, well, I mean, to answer these questions, I mean, first of all, one of the problems in this field is, I'm not sure where the gentleman is that, uh, oh, there you are. I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, okay. I'll look through four people to you. Um, one of the problems in the field is there are few clear success stories when we're talking about DDR and SSR. There's no one exemplar. I mean, some people will refer to the former, in terms of SSR, the former states of Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union. Some would talk about uh, South Africa, um, post-apartheid South Africa. But of course, these are, are far removed from cases like Afghanistan, some of the failed states and, 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 and conflict-affected states we're talking about today. There are elements of success in the Balkans, in Kosovo and Bosnia. There are elements of success in places like Liberia mm -hmm. and, uh, and Sierra Leone that you can draw on for DDR. Um, as well as SSR, but there are a few clear success stories, and we're still developing this doctrine and these ideas. Um, um, so part of this is, I mean, in terms of it, this is sort of a developmental process for these concepts. Um, but even in the Afghan context, even according to the basic policy prescriptions and frameworks and strategies that have been developed from experiences in some of those cases I've talked to, they did not adhere to any of them in many respects. That, and, and there are a number of reasons for this. I mean, there are the, the events on the ground were so problematic, the conditions were so difficult, that it led to expedient thinking on certain cases. Also, there was such a range of interests. It's not like in Sierra Leone where there was one main donor, the British, or, um, uh, or even in Iraq, where there was the United States as one of the main donors. There's a range of different donors. The United States has taken a clear role now, but it, this created huge uh, coordination gaps and problems and uh, discontinuities in the process at various stages. In terms of looking at the historical dimension, absolutely, you can make that comment in terms of state building across the world. We're compressing the state building process, which evolved over hundreds of years in Europe, into five and 10 year time spans. And the problem with, with this in many respects is that um, uh, we just, it, one of the, perhaps I would say is one of the biggest obstacles to state building is the fact that the short-termism of the international community in this process. That because of the nature of our democratic electoral cycles, we can't plan beyond five years. Afghanistan, of course, in 10 years, this is one of the poorest countries in the world that just emerged from 30 years of war. Un even under the best circumstances, it would still be in a difficult position today. Well, I mean, the fact that it was never going to be a Switzerland of Central Asia at this stage in time. So it was always going to be problematic. But the fact that we were, and I think um, uh, Tom's comment that 12 one-year wars Absolutely fabulous. I'm going to steal that. Um, I stole that. Once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's exactly how this has been planned. I can tell you that every time I go to Afghanistan, well, once a year, I it's new rotations of people 
who are there for one year, there for um, two years. There's, there's a few people who have been there for five, six years, and even longer. They're the institutional memory who complain and so on. But in terms of the people actually implementing the programs, there are people who do their tours and leave. And so there's no institutional memory. There's no sort of consistent policy. And I have seen, and those of us at this panel who have seen, and people in the crowd who have watched Afghanistan, have seen this, some of the same ideas recycled several times over over this period. They never, they didn't work the first time and they're not working now. So, so it is a huge problem, but I don't know how we break out of that because that's as much the way we do business as the challenges on the ground. Okay, thank you very much. I wanna take two more questions. I'm, I'm Frat Ron from the Global uh, Work Source Strategy. Uh, I'm an organizational psychologist, so I'm interested in this lack of coordination and integration and the underlying reasons for it. You have so many talented people deployed, but it still doesn't happen. So now, the, what you just said now, Mark, really answers, I think, a big part of this question. Mm -hmm. But I would like to turn to the other um, panelists. I mean, with all the experience that there has been before, so what is it? Is it a lack of will? Is it a lack of doctrine? It's a lack of the will to put effort into it? Is it all together? Or other, uh, other thoughts? And uh, Mark, you just mentioned uh, about uh, the inability or the unwillingness to take political risks. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what mm -hmm. these political mm -hmm. risks mm -hmm. are that you would like to see? Sure. Okay. Let's, let's take this question. You've been waiting patiently for a while. Hi, I'm uh, Joshua Lee, National Defense University. Um, my question is about uh, the future for Afghanistan. Uh, what uh, we, we've learned, uh, what went wrong in the past, but what, where do we go from here? Has <clears throat> has uh, President Obama's surge had a, a positive impact so far, and will it in the future? How vital is uh, Pakistan to the current conflict? Where, where do we go from here? Okay. Thank you. Start. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, the uh, I wrote a paper which was published by Mark. Uh, uh, last year, and uh, I just talk about design of the program, and then as implementation, and that is very important. Unfortunately, in Afghanistan, if you just pick everything, <laughs> we had a problem in the design, and also we have a problem in the implementations. Uh, the reason is that, again, is go back to the political will. Uh, and the short-term objectives, uh, I just talk about that because Yes, always there is a short-term objective, mid-term and long-term, but the question is, whatever you do in the short-term has to fit into the long-term objectives. But if it is not fit to that and just undermine the long-term objectives, then we will have a problem. Uh, for example, like uh, uh, it is mentioned before, is uh, just CMY, for example, Minister of Interior. In the last one year, maybe restructured two or three times, you know? So every year just come with uh, people and just put with new cover sheet and just say this is a new idea. <laughs> uh, and uh, and really this is a big problem. If you just go back those who have an uh, institution memory and what has happened uh, and we just look back okay why this program has failed, what was the reason, uh, how it is <coughs> you know succeeded or what is a uh, positive story on that and then why it has failed let's improve that. Not to start everything from uh, beginning again you know just to create a parallel organization and others. Uh, so this is the issue. Question is, what we'll do in the future? Uh, it is very difficult questions, you know, to answer. Still, I don't see it the right way. Uh, because still we don't, our political objective is not quite clear. We have a coin strategy, but what is, they have to meet the political objectives, you know? So that was the reason it is not linked to fit into the political objectives, and that still is missing. And always I just, somebody asked me a question, I just give you a famous story of Mulan Nasruddin. And he was uh, riding on the donkey and somebody asked him, Mullah said, where are you going? He said, don't ask me, ask the donkey where he is going, you know? Because I'm just sitting on the donkey. And so sometimes we don't know which direction we are going, you know? Uh, honestly. Uh, yeah, th I would sort of like to give an answer that uh, addresses, uh, I think, the whole uh, variety of questions. Uh, beginning with a question about uh, an improved DDR process. I, I, I think it's actually a mistake to have lumped all these uh, different and disparate and qualitatively different kinds of efforts into the DDR program. If you work backwards from the R to the second D to the first D, I mean, reintegration is, is not really a military task per se. Uh, you know, it's, it's really a broad social task. 
and even demobilization of militias, but particularly Afghan militias, is both a political and a social task and not a narrow military task. So to have set the parameters so broadly for the program was kind of a recipe for, uh, a recipe for failure. But uh, apropos of the question of the future of Af Afghanistan and to uh, uh, further disappoint uh, uh, my brother from uh, the Cato uh, Institute, uh, I, I think uh, really even now we're at the beginning of a long story of American engagement, um, not only in Afghanistan but in South Asia, uh, broadly speaking. It's too important a strategic uh, issue for the United States. And uh, even though uh, much of many of our efforts, uh, both saved in the Persian Gulf or even in Europe, have been, at least to my mind, uh, uh, a fumbling around trial and error um, uh, situation where we uh, try all the bad answers before we uh, uh, find a solution, uh, I'm willing to, to bet anybody a, a six pack uh, <laughs> that, uh, although not much more, uh, that uh, over the course of time, uh, we stick with it, uh, again, just because we can't afford to walk away. I'm heartened by the uh, progress that's, you know, the, the President Obama has learned some lessons. He uh, kind of didn't want to be here in the first place, thought, like the Bush administration before him, uh, that it was going to be a relatively low-cost uh, commitment. But uh, despite a lot of kicking and screaming, uh, he's both extended the duration of the commitment. We've gone from a 2011 time horizon to the 2014 time horizon, technically past uh, his first term in office. Uh, and of course, uh, the level of forces has been uh, increased even uh, in the last month, <coughs> uh, I think, to try to uh, secure what uh, the administration and the command in Afghanistan believes are genuine gains uh, of the past uh, fighting season. I don't think this administration would have increased its bet if it doesn't think it was betting on a winner. So uh, it's I think it'll be long, it'll be hard, but I think we'll also stick with it. Okay, can we take two more questions <coughs> over here? Uh, my name is Arnold Zeitlin, <clears throat> and I covered Afghanistan for the Associated Press between 1969 and 1973, which was a period of relative tranquility at that time. Uh, I've uh, just come back from eight years in China, so I've missed a lot. Uh, I was particularly struck by Mr. Donnelly's remark, uh, not only what he just said now, but when he spoke earlier of a um, uh, obligation to Afghanistan. And I would appreciate if he could expand on that or explain what that obligation is and uh, from where in Afghanistan it stems. Now, you also just mentioned uh, we can't walk away, and I'd like to ask you if you could expand on that thought as well. Okay. okay. Please, next, we'll just take the second question, and then we'll go to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm Tony Drexler, and I'm an international health consultant, recently back from Kabul. Uh, and I was, I was really struck by what appears to be the la the Kind of, first of all, the total national focus of everything you're talking about, and except for Shah Mahmoud's comments, or some of them, uh, the lack of recognition of, the, of ethnicity, the role of the Northern Alliance, both in defense, interior, um, and in the police and A&A, and, &A, and how this affects uh, DDRSSR, and then Leading from that, what appears to be a growth of Northern Alliance cohesion, uh, strength, independence at the present time, uh, which may dominate the future. I appreciate some comments. Thanks. Thanks very much. Mark, you want to start? Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, just a, a plug. Uh, Shah Mahmoud mentioned his paper, and I encourage you to look at it. We, we publish a number of papers of different... Um, uh, Afghans as well as those who know Afghanistan well called the Afghanistan Papers at www.cgonline.org so check it out um, 
the I would answer this question about what risks. What, what do I mean by political risks? Well, one of the things is the United States early on was unwilling to engage or intervene in what they called green on green conflicts among their allies on the ground, nor to put significant pressure on Northern Alliance and other important proxy actors on the ground who were allied. And those were some of, uh, of the actors who were the, the, the most blatant offenders in terms of rearming, in terms of destabilizing the government. That was one clear area where they could have taken a tough stand and put some, pre because they had a lot of the leverage, right, mm -hmm. on various levels, leverage in terms of providing economic incentives and leverage um, in terms of, of threatening. So I think that's the area um, where there could have been a, a lot more movement. The Japanese at one stage refused to commit more funds and they were able to get the defense ministry to move um, in terms of of, of making some appointments, one of which brought Rahim Wardak into the, the Minister of Defense uh, portfolio. Well, he was as Deputy Minister of Defense and later to become Minister of Defense. If the Japanese were able to do that on a very limited basis, the United States had a lot more scope um, in order to, to use some of that political leverage. Uh, in terms of uh, ethnicity, you know, in Afghanistan, nobody can dominate uh, one tribal group, uh, the country. Uh, because we saw it in the, during Taliban time, we saw it with the Northern Alliance, we saw it with the communist regime in that time, you know, this faction were existing, these things. Uh, the reason is that whatever is going on now, they use ethnicity as a tool for their own political objectives, you know. For example, if we just see, I'm originally from Kunar province. Uh, we had a problem, not with Uzbeks there. We had a problem with our own warlords, with our own criminals in our own area, you know. If you just go for each of these players, they just suppress their own tribe more than they just did the other tribes, you know. And so that was the reason is that they just play as a game. Uh, but of course, uh, it is more political when I just say political will and political issue uh, is uh, because you cannot find a government in the world if you are in the government, you are against the government, you know. Just I give you this example. Uh, if minister talk with the ministers, he is complaining about the government. The governor is complaining about the government. Sometimes I just call it as a, like a national or international depressions, you know. Everybody, if you are in the government, you are unhappy. If you are outside of the government, you are not happy. If you are rich, you are not happy. If you are poor, you are not happy. International community is not happy. The half ones is not happy. This is kind of more political issue, you know. Uh, when we just say there's no military solution to Afghanistan, so there's a political issue. These are the political issues. This gross happiness is missing. You know, um, I just mentioned my paper, which is published. For example, when I see developments in Afghanistan, yes, Afghanistan is a poor, uh, underdeveloped. It will stay for many years. Uh, but still, the, with all these corruption, with all these mismanagement, with all these uh, whatever you just call it, uh, war, Still, the progress is happening in the country. It has not happened in the history of that country. In terms of schools built, uh, access to resources, roads, uh, you know, to education, and so many other things has happened. Uh, with even the 10% money is used in Afghanistan. 90% went to whatever uh, way. Uh, but uh, still it has happened, but still people are not happy. So the question is that we should design some things link the security, governance, and development together. But now everything's going isolated from each other. Uh, for example, I just give you one uh, practical example. The, the district where I'm from, it was very unstable two years ago. And then with change of one police chief in their districts, it's become stable. The same resources, the same structures, the same rules, regulations, laws, and others. Why he just engaged the community there, the elders, uh, and then in that way he brought the stability. And he was just removed in order to do a good job, you have to be removed from your uh, place. And so he was removed like uh, months ago. Now our district has become unstable again. You know? So that is a political will, how to engage people, how to really, you know, uh, people feel themselves. If they just go to the police, they should not mm -hmm. afraid from that, you know. They should be part of the solution, not part of the problem. The same the government, other actors in the government also. Or they should not be biased to one group and another group in the area. Uh, and so that is very important, to play an impartial agent role, you know, the government official, if it is civilian, military, police, and others. I okay. thought I'd speak to your um, point about ethnicities a little bit, just um, with some data. Um, it, 
international stakeholders um, have tried to get the uh, army to be constructed along more ethnically diverse lines. Um, but the, you know, despite some apparent successes in that area, there's some interesting um, recent data that, that show that there's still problems of factionalism and patronage, patronage networks there. Um, so for example, uh, some data from exactly one year ago, January 2010, uh, found that Pashtuns represented 42.6% of the army, Tajiks 40.98%, Hazaras 7.68%, Uzbeks 4.05%, other minorities, 4.68%. Uh, and the analysis concludes that while the presence of Pashtuns at all levels of the military corresponds to their proportion of the general population, Tajiks continue to dominate the officer and NCO ranks, so that there's some, you know, those types of disparities. Northern versus Southern Pashtuns. Pardon me? Northern versus Southern Pashtuns. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it breaks yeah. even within yeah. the, the ethnic you have, you know, these different patronage networks within them. So there's the, these various overlays of. Okay, I have a, another uh, question I want to throw into this and then give you a, uh, a chance to respond to that. Okay. Unless you. I can wait. I can wait. You can wait? Okay. Yeah, I can wait. All right, all right. All right. Sometimes these burning desires are just. <laughs> well, there was. There was but, uh, you know, there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a new um, DDR process that's underway right now. And then as, um, as a result of President Karzai's decision to get rid of private security companies, um, there's been a move now to create something called the Afghan Public Protection Force, which will be a force that will provide the same services that private security companies are providing. And this force will be located under the direction of the Ministry of the Interior. Um, the number that's being discussed is 25,000 new people under arms. Uh, clearly, some of the people that are serving in private security firms now, when those jobs go away, will be wanting to transfer over into the new organization. So I want to throw that into the equation here and ask the panel what they think about the creation of this new organization and how this works in the ministry and how this may or may not <coughs> benefit from the experiences of, of the first DDR. So, uh, Bob, if I may uh, address the prior question sure. that Go was, ahead. well, it was <coughs> pointed at me, so uh, feel an obligation to answer the question about that, obligations. It's very good of you. I mean, um, most people would duck it, but. Uh, okay, well, uh, I, so I think the moral obligation is, is fairly straightforward and transparent. Um, nobody uh, has had a larger hand in, um, you know, certainly initially creating uh, the post-Taliban uh, experience or state uh, than we have done, but I also think this is a case where uh, our strategic interests are all also uh, deeply engaged, not only in the narrow sense of um, uh, securing the situation inside the borders of Afghanistan or even in the sort of uh, global war on terror uh, sense, but as I suggested earlier, uh, it's a part of the world that uh, is extremely volatile uh, was always important and with which we've always engaged, but is only becoming more so. I mean, two statistics worth noting are the doubling of the Pakistani nuclear arsenal over the last uh, several years. And although it's not really a statistic, but, but the rise of India uh, as a strategic partner of the United States and potentially a global great power uh, is, I think, just... Uh, uh, important to the United States and been ratified uh, both beginning with the Clinton administration but continuing through the Bush administration and now again under President Obama. So it's a uh, it's something that the United States has has recognized as a increasingly important uh, both partnership um, and uh, uh, a part of the world that uh, which we care about uh, and care about the geopolitical future of. Do we have a comment on either the previous question or the current question, which is what about the creation of this new organization which will provide guard services? You know, again, as I uh, go back to my analogy, you know, uh, whatever short-term objective has to fit into the long-term goals, you know, how to build. For example, uh, how much money we spend on the police reform, billions of dollars. Why we should create something else, you know, and just uh, to undermine that upon local police or whatever, something like that way. Or, for example, this DDR again has happened, this Taliban reintegration, you know. 
okay, 10 people join and give some money and then 10 others will come, you know, and then we can link it to the employment and others. 45% people are employed, whatever, 50%, whatever is uh, in the country. Okay, if 1,000 people just come back and you provide an incentive and others, 1,000 others will join with the insurgency, you know. So that was the reason you should have a comprehensive plan, how to bring security, stability to Afghanistan, and link it to the good governance, and also then the developments will happen, the second uh, things. If that does not happen, and just focus on uh, seasonal, you know, uh, or a year by year strategy and others, it doesn't work because this, this is an insurgency. Insurgency is a, in one place it is a stable in the summer, unstable in the winter, and so many other things that happen like this way. And also, if you have a comprehensive plan, you can explain it very well to the people. You know, that is more important things. Now, when I just give you this, my story before, in my level, I don't understand what is going on, you know, because we cannot explain to the people of Afghanistan, okay, this is our objective, this is our strategy, this is a program we want to implement it. And this way, people will believe that, you know. And so now we, if people, we cannot explain it very well, then people believe uh, rumors, uh, disinformation, misinformation, conspiracy theories, and so many other things will happen to that. Uh, even this uh, reconciliation plan, we cannot explain it very well to the people, really what we want to achieve, you know, how we want to achieve it, uh, some things. And uh, uh, private security, it is a big problem from the day one, you know, as a, still is a problem. There is no uh, doubt in that. But the question is how we can link the security really to strengthen the MOI, and MOI should be function very well. Uh, and now if you just go to all this recruitment MOI, the top police chief in the country is uh, uh, more than half of them is, uh, they're not professional. Still there are the mullahs, there's the commanders and others, they are in charge in different places. If you just go police chief in uh, Badakhshan is also mullah, police chief in uh, Kunduz is also, you know, something, this doesn't work like that way. So you should have a really good, you know, uh, system. There good reward and punishment, and then uh, uh, take, you know, cooperation from the people, and just go back again. It's coming to the political will, you know, uh, because in order to remove a bad person from the system, you need political will, you know. Mm -hmm. If that is not there, uh, always I just uh, when we just I gave a resignation from the government. I said even in that time, you know. When the engine is broke, change driver 20 times, you cannot go anywhere, you know. So the engine, we have to fix the system. We have to <coughs> fix uh, some things. Then the resources is, is important. But if you don't use the resources in the right way, no matter how much money you throw in the country and how much money you just give, you cannot bring stability. Just in short, thank you. Thanks very much. Does anybody I, I have can, a comment? I just wanted to, Mark. you know, I, talking about the creation of these local, more informalized security forces. I mean, again, getting back to the short-termism, there I can list off, there was the Afghan National Auxiliary Police, the Afghan Guard Force, the Afghan Local Police, the Afghan Public Protection Program, and I could go on, okay? These have all been tried. They failed for various reasons. There was Taliban infiltration because of poor vetting mechanisms. They weren't effective. They weren't given proper training. <clears throat> this is police light. It's an attempt to meet a security vacuum quickly by arming local people. It's often based on a misunderstanding of, 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 of Afghan militia, historical militia structures like the Arbaki and so on. Um, so, and, and this really reflects both the poor understanding of the local context um, and, and, and also the short-termism, this push to get results quickly. So even though, as Tom says, we are there for the long term, at least I would hope, but we keep planning in these short time cycles. And each new rotation wants to make a big impact. So they initiate these programs which have been tried. They don't know the lessons. And then, unfortunately, we fail. The problem is it's not just a matter of wasting resources. We do harm, because we've armed some of these groups in this context. We've given them guns. Okay, so they, we've rearmed these groups, we've introduced new weapons into these areas. So, and also alienated local people because these, uh, uh, these local police forces tend to be poorly trained, abusive of the local population. We alienate the professional police who said, why did I go through police training and so on when I could have been a local police, get paid the same amount for, uh, and, and only get two weeks of training. Um, I think it, it, these are bad signs. If we consider even the formal police process, 
we've act in recent months or in the last year, they've reduced the actual training period for the formal police from eight to six weeks. At the very time we say we need more professional police, we're reducing the training. Now I questioned some people at the NATO training mission. They said, no, 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 but we make them, tra we train them on weekends now as well. So it's actually, uh, you know, it's close to the same amount. But th this, is, this is the problem. We're going for quantity over quality. Um, and I understand, I, I'm not, by the way, I under, completely understand the pressures on our people on the ground, and I don't necessarily blame them. There's some bad policies being introduced, but there's a lot of pressure to produce results quickly. We, we have to introduce timelines. President Obama and so, so on, even though behind closed doors we know we're going to be there for a while, but for public consumption, for political reasons, we have to say, you know, this is when we're going to reevaluate. And, and although I think some governments, like my own, may exa r rightly start to pull out a lot of our, our investments, um, which is, is, is a bad sign. But um, so we have to get over this short termism because that's one of the, the big problems here. Okay, I think we're approaching the. Um the hour when we're, we're going to disperse, I'd like to offer the panel an opportunity for one last comment, and then we'll conclude. Do you want to begin? Um, I, I just thought I would reemphasize the, the theme of political will that came out across um, and everyone here that, you know, there's, there's real agreement along the lines of uh, the lack of political will, both in terms of international actors and actors on the ground um, contributing to some of the <coughs> very real failures involved with some of this. Uh, thank you. Just, you know, in terms of in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. is, uh, there is no option B, you know. I just say this thing quite clearly. Because the option A has to work, meaning there should be a stability one way. I'm not saying to build very, you know, Modern Afghanistan, but at least there should be stability. Otherwise, yeah. this time we will have a more bigger problem because of the sophistication of the uh, Al Qaeda and their networks in Afghanistan in the region. It is very big, and also we should plan. For example, if we have a, like 2014, what is our planning, political planning for that? Because we should not manage crisis after crisis. You know, now we are in that uh, cycle. One crisis finished, we just start with another one. How to fix that? And so we have to be a little bit proactive. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've said pretty much uh, everything that I meant to say, but just to sort of go back to the beginning uh, and focusing narrowly on, on the DDR program, I would say it achieved the one thing that it was really capable of achieving, and uh, the failings of the program, uh, even though they're uh, well documented, uh, really ought to have uh, their missions, essentially, that should have been done in other programs uh, and in other places by other folks. Um, so uh, the lesson I would take is that we should not try to uh, jam too large a set of ambitions into a narrowly designed program intended to uh, uh, take the, the, uh, the firepower and the mobility away from the malign actors uh, that existed when the program began. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mark, yeah. last word. Okay. I, you know, mm -hmm. I think some of the, we have to, in a way, rethink how we do these processes. And as I said, we are in the stage still of de developing doctrine. It's happening here in the U.S. government. It's happening globally um, in, in terms of how to work in these difficult environments. Um, and there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from the Afghan case. I think initially we have to, we tend to operate with templates in many of this, these environments. I think there has to be a, a lot more of a focus on how you can improve the situation for people on the ground, improve security, improve governance. That means working at the subnational level. Um, that means investing the proper political resources and political capital into this process to actually succeed. Um, you know, I think this is a long-term endeavor. And I mean, fundamentally, I think to echo uh, what Shah Mahmood says, uh, has just said, I, I think that there is no plan B. And I think we have to realize what are the consequences of failure um, in this context. And the consequences of failure uh, are pretty, pretty drastic, um, uh, both for the interests of the international community, but just as much uh, for Afghans themselves. So uh, with that, um, I'd also just like to, to thank to thank Bob for organizing such a fantastic panel and for inviting me here to DC. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite a round of applause to the panel. I'd like to thank you all for coming um, and uh, remind you of a couple of things. 
One, uh, Professor Hartzell's uh, paper will be online probably within 60 days. Uh, the move will slow us down a bit, but we, we promise you that. And secondly, I want you all to um, watch out for the next invitation to the next SSR working group, which will be in the new building. And so we'll look forward to welcoming you there. Thanks a lot.